Okay, so I found that website I was looking for. So get the details now behind uh, an activism. Um, this is from a website called enolagaya.com, um, and it's put together by Dr. Randall Whitaker. So thank you to him. Um, an active cognition is presented as a third alternative to the currently prevalent schools of cognitivism and emergence. The former is that perspective emphasizing symbolization, represental, uh, representation, and the computer as a metaphor for a cognitive system. The latter is that perspective emphasizing behavioral slash configurational emergence in parallel distributed networks, and this formal model inspired by the neural system as a metaphor for a cognitive system. Because the definition of an active cognitive science is accomplished primarily through comparisons and contrasts with the other two paradigms, it is best explained in the same manner. Uh, so I'm going to ask, uh, there's a series of questions, um, and then the answers from each of the three perspectives. Um, so the, the basic metaphor for the mind for uh, cognitivism or representationalism is a digital computer. Um, the basic metaphor for the mind for emergentism or connectionism is a parallel distributed network. So in other words, the mind is um, a collection of all these feedback loops um, in symbiosis that give rise to a higher level property of some kind. That's emergence. And then a uh, metaphor for the mind for an action, uh, for an activism is, uh, well, it's inseparable from experience your phenomenological experience in the world so you can't really you can't really characterize the mind as this discrete thing whether it's a you know a hard drive with a bunch of software running on it or whether it's a collection of distributed networks or whether uh, you, you can't say the mind is this this term that sort of lies in between our individuality our experience and our communion or our relationship with the world with others you know, mind requ requires both of these things. There's no mind without world. So the metaphor for the mind in, in action is very, um, it's very slippery. It's inseparable from experience on the world. Um, and the metaphor for cognition now, for thinking, uh, for cognitivism, thinking is symbol processing. Um, for emergence, thinking is the emergence of global states. So we think when, again, these higher level properties, these relations between collections of neurons um, fire in sequence uh, in a way that uh, self-references just right based on our past experience and the memory that we've built up, uh, the connections that, that have been formed, and, and that global property tells us what to do. So there's still symbols they're just global symbols instead of thinking of it as each neuron is a thought which is almost what uh, the idea of uh, being a bunch of symbols in there means instead of thinking of that it's more you know it's the relationships between those symbols and then uh, for an, an activism the metaphor for cognition is is ongoing interaction within the medium um, and this relates to autopoiesis um, in the sense that uh, an autopoetic system is a self-creating system with, with an ongoing interaction within a medium. So it's, think of, um, think of a cell um, living, say, in, in a petri dish. The medium is, is the water in the petri dish, and the cell um, has this ongoing interaction that is self-contained and self-creating. And um, in this theory of autopoiesis, cognition is not something that the mind does. Cognition is something that the whole body does. The whole body is a cognition, or a, co a cognitivizer, if you will. The whole, so all organisms then become cognitive organisms. What it means to be alive is to be a cognitive, um, a cognitive process, a cognitive entity. So there's no, there's no distinction between mind and body in that sense. Um, autopoetic systems are, by virtue of being autopoetic systems, cognitive. So again, cognition for an activism is an ongoing interaction within the medium. 
for whatever system it is you're talking about as, as a cognizing system. Um, the relation, uh, the world in relation to us for these theories, the world in relation to us for cognitivism is separate and objective. There's an external world out there. And the same thing for, for emergentism. The, the world is separate and objective and we merely represent it. Um, but for cognition, of course, it's representable in symbols. Or for cognitivism, it's represented in symbols. And for emergentism, it's represented in patterns of network activation. Whereas um, the world in inactivism is, is related to us in the sense that we are engaged with it and it's brought forth by, by our action, by our ongoing interaction in the medium. It's brought, we bring forth this world. Um, and in that sense, it's not representable, it's only presentable through action. It's always right at hand. We're in the world, we're engaged in it. Um, so the mind versus the body. Now, this is the dualism aspect. The mind and the body are separate in both uh, cognitivism and um, emergentism. They're separable. They're just they're separate things, separate categories. Um, and for, for cognitivism, this is, this is because of um, the basic cog uh, Cartesian dualism that the, the mind and the body are hermetically sealed from each other. And for emergentism, it's still uh, this epiphenomenal dualism. The, the mind is this epiphenomenon that sort of floats above the brain. Um, so the mind is related to the body and the world via emergence. So there's this there's this self-referencing that is the mind and then the body is the first level. But there's still, you see, there's this, there's this separation between the two. Um, for an activism, mind and body are totally inseparable. And um, we have to look at phenomenology to explain what's going on here because the mind and the world are brought forth, they're enacted, hence an activism, in a history of connections. Um, so for an activism, everything is connected. There's no separation between anything I know and anything I do. No separation between my mind and my body. No separation between knowing and acting. Knowing is acting. Knowing is doing. And doing is knowing. Because we're engaged in this world. Irrevocably involved. And um, we can't make reference to some external, objective, indifferent, physical world in order to explain anything. Because we're doing it all. Not me personally. We. And this gets back to intersubjectivity. Um, any desire that I have, you are going to feel. Any fear that I have, you are going to feel. Anything that I feel inside is going to affect the way I communicate to others. It's going to affect the way they communicate to me. We affect each other. We are always co-creating every situation we get into with one another. But, and it feels like I'm the one doing it always. You know, if I'm nervous, if I'm anxious, if I'm holding something back. When the situation is over and, and I have time to reflect on it, I'll think, next time I'm not going to do that. You know, next time I'm going to, I'm going to just speak, speak my mind and, and be open and honest, but then it happens again the next time we, we, we were involved with, with whatever this particular conversation with this person is or this situation, and we realize, well, maybe it's not me, maybe it's them. Maybe they're the ones that are uncomfortable, and I'm just reacting to it. But really, is there ever a separation between the two? I don't know if there is, and, and is there any way to tell? Probably not, I mean, definitely not. So when we become intersubjective, when we intersubject my subjecthood and your subjecthood become interdependent. So I rely on you and you rely on me to bring forth both of our identities. 